I could see the city plex towers. He had me praying over America. And uh, so when I stood up to speak, to represent the heart of the Father, I, that's what I said. As I said, I've come to bring you the word from the Father. This eagle, I'm going to show you in just a moment, landed right on this uh, this platform. It was a golden eagle, which is interesting because Richard Roberts, he named the mascot of ORU the golden eagle. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Second thing is it represents America because the Bible says that it was through a prophet that God preserved and delivered Israel. And it was on the wings of an eagle. So God was like in the prophetic anointing to eagles. So this eagle was staring. I spoke for 20 minutes. He came in at the moment I started and looked the whole time with piercing eyes, looking at the people, listening to what was being said, I believe. I believe it's from heaven. I believe it represents America. And then the minute I said, now receive the words from the Father, the word of the Lord, and I turned around and started walking, he flew away. Look at this eagle. This is what appeared right on the window. Look at his eyes. He ain't playing. I don't know. I said, Jesus, did you appear as an eagle or what? I mean, I don't know, but look at that. that he stayed there the whole time. And that's what those spikes are, is so that they can't land on the window or they'll get hurt. See, that, that's not trees. Those are spikes down by his, his feet. Look at him. 60th floor window. People were in shock. I mean, when the Lord was sharing his words, they were crying and they were visibly shaken. But boy, did that add to it. You know, I was really grateful. I'm like, you know, if you're going to share a strong word, man, it's kind of nice to have a sign. <laughs> so I told God, I said, God, this is really neat. So, all right, well, that's good. You can show the other picture. This is just a picture of my American flag. I'm praying over America and, and uh, Tulsa. Anyway, I, I like the eagle better. So, all right, well, let's, let's go to Matthew chapter 21. I want to talk. I want to talk about the biblical account of Palm Sunday. I want to also talk about what was happening. I want to talk about, um, you know, why did um, they ask a question? You're going to see the question. And uh, I like to preach this pretty much every Palm Sunday, but I feel like God gave me some really cool stuff to kind of add to maybe some of you that maybe have heard me preach about the real meaning of what Palm Sunday is about. In Matthew 21, let's start there in verse 1. It says, Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent, notice how many? Two disciples, underline two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you'll find a donkey tied, underline that, and a colt with her. Loose them. So Luke and John's account, for whatever reason, they only put an emphasis on one of the donkeys. They didn't think that it was necessary. So then, you know, people think that the Bible contradicts itself. No, it's just that Matthew went a little bit more into detail. There was the, the mother, and then there was the little donkey that had never been ridden before. Okay, so how I many you know them? And, and then it says, saying to them, go in the village, you'll see a donkey and a colt with their loose them and bring them to me. Verse 3 and if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. Okay, keep reading. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, behold your, notice the descriptions now, king. Your king is coming. So when Jesus rode in on the donkey, it was a sign that he was the king and is the king of kings. Lowly, sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. Now, you've got to stop right there because I'm going to tell you what happened also in history with Pontius Pilate and the Roman government. This is why they were stirred up. Pontius Pilate was uh, sent by Caesar to get into the city because they thought that this was going to be the year that the king was going to come. Are you, are, you, are you here? And don't think this was some nice little lowly, humble entrance. Jesus on purpose with the instruction of the Father was countering the other kingdom. And he wasn't afraid to interject himself governmentally. Because if you know that Pilate's going to come in and the Roman government already is looking for a reason to get harsher on the Jews, why would you purposely at that time challenge when Pontius Pilate will talk about is on the other side of the city coming in with a huge Roman procession that history says was one of the loudest entrance of the Roman soldiers that that's that time that they had ever heard. So Jesus on purpose interjected in the government 
interjected at that time to make a statement. All right, keep reading. Verse 6, let's go on. Tell, uh, if they can go quicker, that would be great. So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. Let's just keep going. Now they brought the donkey and the colt, notice both, laid their clothes on them and set him on them. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Now they've been doing this for a thousand years. This was not unique to that day. They've been doing it for thousands of years. And here's how you know. Because the Jewish custom was every time at this time, that we say Palm Sunday, at this time of their feast, they would quote out of the book of Psalm, Psalm 118, and the other Psalms like 119. And here's what they would say every year for thousands of years. The multitudes would gather and they would begin to say, Hosanna to the son of David. Underline that. Why would they say the son of David? Because you'll find out in the book of Samuel, when David was naming his successor, Solomon his son, to be the king, he put him on a donkey, and then the people waited for the entrance of King David's son on a donkey, and they would celebrate. Whose son was coming in this day? The father. And he was saying, this is the king. This is the one that I'm giving all authority and power to, just like David did. That's why they were saying son of David. And he did it with his son Solomon. And you could read that in the book of Samuel. In fact, I'll give you the reference if you'd like to have that. Uh, it's in 1, Samuel, uh, 1 Kings 1.33. All right, now let's watch. Saying, Hosanna, they said this for thousands of years. Blessed is he. And others are saying, is this the time now that our king is coming? Who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. In other words, Lord, you're going to save us. Now watch what happens. And when Jesus comes into Jerusalem... All the city was moved. Now, do you think Pontius Pilate and the Roman government liked this? But notice when they swung the gate open, because that's what they did every year, is they, they would go and get the sacrificial lamb up in Bethlehem. Where was Jesus born? And the priest would go, the high priest with the priests, and they would go into Bethlehem, and they would find the lamb that was spotless, a male lamb, born in a manger, a feeding trough, every year. And that high priest would get on a donkey, he would carry the lamb in his lap, and then they would go back. The other priest that stayed back would gather the whole city because it was a sign that one day our Messiah is going to come. Well, this year he came. And so when they threw the city gates open like they did every year, they were expecting the high priest carrying the lamb. Then they opened the gates, and look at what they said. Who is this? <laughs> Can you hear the disappointment? Can you hear the anger? Can you hear the outrage of religious demons? Who is this? This is not the high priest. And where is our lamb that's going to atone for the sins that we've committed all year? They were mad. Luke 19, you can read that account. Look at what Luke 19 says. All right, now you know why. Look at Luke 19, 38 through 40. Look at what they, the Pharisees said when they swung the gates open. Who is this? Look at what they said in Luke 19, verse 38. The people began to rejoice. There's, they were saying, blessed be the king that comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Look at verse 39. And some of the Pharisees and even probably those of the priesthood from among the multitude said in, Master, tell your disciples to shut up. And Jesus turned around. Watch what he said in verse 40. He said to them, I tell you, if these would hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. You know what he was saying? I'm the rock. I created those rocks. And even my rock, my creation recognizes me more than you that's made in my image. So go back to verse 10. They swing open the city gates and they say, who is this? So you got to understand the high priest would go in every year. They did it for years. They, it would gather the people of the city while the high priest was gathering the lamb from Bethlehem. The high priest would sit on a donkey. He would ride in representing the king that would eventually come carrying a lamb. Now, I ask you a question. You know when they opened the gates in verse 10, who is this? You know what it was? 
They didn't understand it was prophetic. Not only was it their king, but Jesus would not only die on a cross, but he would be resurrected and then he would ascend and he would go, the Bible says in the book of Hebrews, into the throne room, the holy of all holy places, the throne room. And he would be carrying his own blood from the crucifixion. And he would carry it into the holy place and he would put that blood upon the mercy seat. God the Father, he came in as a man because he represented all mankind. And he sat down. God the Father said, sit down, called him God until all thy enemies become thy footstool. And he was and is now our high priest. So here Jesus was the high priest. It wasn't the, it wasn't Caiaphas. (laughs) <laughs> that's why do you think Caiaphas was so mad and all he could think about remember when Caiaphas they were bringing Jesus to him and he said no we have to crucify this man and notice what he did he caved in like a lot of preachers he said if we don't cave into the government if we don't give the government what they want then they're going to destroy us and they're going to destroy our temple the truth of the matter is they would have destroyed it anyway If you don't speak up, they're going to destroy you. They're going to take your churches away, your freedoms, your religious liberties. And so Caiaphas was mad. He's the guy that was supposed to be bringing in the lamb. And they're looking, and Jesus is proclaiming himself as the high priest. And he's proclaiming himself as as the sacrificial lamb that's going to take away the sins of the whole world. Now you know why they were so angry when they tried him in the days that we're going to celebrate even this coming week, 2,000 years ago. But I want you to look at this. Who is this? It was always an issue with Jesus about who is he? They questioned him. They cornered him throughout history. In fact, when Jesus was standing before Pontius Pilate, Pontius Pilate got so bold with Jesus, and he pointed his finger up, and Jesus wouldn't answer him. And he pointed his finger with Roman arrogance And he said, do you not know that I, Pontius Pilate, by the powers of the Roman government, have the authority to crucify you? And then Jesus decides to speak. And he probably had blood in his eyes and his eyes were beaten. Bruised, his lips swollen. He looked up. I can just imagine his eyes piercing through the cuts, the bruising, the bleeding of his beautiful eyes. I've seen them. And I guarantee you they pierced the very heart of Pilate. And he said, you have no power unless it had been given to you of my father. And then Pilate says, so tell me plainly, are you the king of the Jews? Are you this man? And Jesus answers in the literal, literal, literal meaning. He said these words, you bet, watch, I am. I am is the name of God. You bet I am. Pilate, even after being warned in a dream from his wife, washes his hands. Now, it's interesting about Pilate because, uh, again, I'm not telling you to build doctrine. There's books that didn't make the uh, canon of Scripture, but there is a book called the book of Nicodemus. How many remember the guy that Jesus came to at night in John chapter 3? He got gloriously saved and wrote a gospel. And in it, he talks about what happened to Pontius Pilate. And he talks about how Pontius Pilate got converted. And he literally uh, was so distraught that he had had crucified the Son of God. And he talks about how Pilate couldn't sleep, he couldn't rest, he couldn't live with himself. And he began to be converted. Well, his wife, Claudia, uh, began to be extremely radical and welcomed by the church. In fact, uh, the, the early fathers and even the Orthodox Greeks uh, recognized Claudia as somebody of really high esteem that got saved and was being baptized in the church and began to be a leader. In fact, look at 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 21. Historians and theologians think that this is who Paul was greeting. You ever wondered who this person is? Do thy diligence to come before thy winter. Uh, Ubelis. Can you imagine having a name, Ubelis? Hey, Uber, how you doing? That's where Ubers, that's in the Bible, that's where Ubers came from. You know, that's your first example of Ubers. So Ubelis, he had the first Ubers. They had donkeys back then. Greet thee and Pudens and Linus. 
All right, and Claudia, that was, uh, historians and theologians say that was Pontius Pilate's wife. But he was forced, history says, and according to the gospel of Nicodemus, that he was forced to commit suicide. In other words, how many of you see what they do today? Oh, that guy committed suicide. And then when they do forensic tests, it's like, well, nobody can shoot themselves like that. So that's what they believe happened, that uh, Pilate was killed and they framed it and made it look like he committed suicide because him and his wife were starting to cause problems. Well, what would you do if all of a sudden Jesus looks up at you and tells you, you have no power, tells you, are are you the son of God? You bet I am. Can you imagine how that verberated and vibrated the very being of Pontius Pilate? You'd probably get saved too, right? So... Let's look here. Look at Exodus chapter 3. I want to take you on a little journey. So God comes to Moses. And I want you to see this because sometimes we read over this, you know, and I want to show you a principle. If you really want to develop intimacy with God, you need to understand before this experience in Exodus chapter 3, Moses and the children of Israel only knew God as Elohim. He was just God. He was never, he was the God of the nation, but he wasn't on a personal level. That's why when Jesus appeared to Mary Magdalene, he said, Mary, Mary, quit clinging onto me. I've not yet ascended, watch this, to my father, your father. That was foreign, and he didn't use the word father. He actually used the Aramaic word uh, Abba, daddy. I've not yet ascended to my daddy or your daddy. My God, your God. Israel only had an understanding, really, of God as this powerful being. You know, they didn't understand the personal relationship that God was trying to bring. That's why Jesus, when he introduced, he said, it's the father first. There is, there is intimacy. So now watch Moses now is called and commissioned uh, by God, uh, God here. Moses is to go to Pharaoh. Let's pick up the story. And God, so Moses said, God, behold, Elohim, when I come unto the children of Israel and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers have sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? Now, look at the brilliance of our God. Look at how he answers. God said unto him, I am that I am. That's my name. I am loving. I am peace. I am provision. I am healing. I am comfort. I am wisdom. Everything you need is in the name that he named himself. That's why never, ever, ever think that you are in this world struggling, that you are in this world without hope, that you are in this world without an answer. You are in this world without divine intervention. We have, I am is his name. I am what you need. I am there for you. I mean, what a name. I told God when I was studying in Tulsa in the mornings in my hotel, I said, God, I just, I I am, you are, I am. I love that name. I love that. I just love that name. And he said, thou shall say unto them, to the children of Israel, I am has sent me unto you. Now, I'll just pick up, we'll go go now to another one. I want you to look now at uh, Matthew chapter uh, 8, verse 27. So let's go to the New Testament. Again, the question of who God is. And I, and I like this because, you know, when Moses, in the previous passage that we looked at, I like this. And I want you to hear this about America right now. Because, you know, I, I was even on the panel, and I could just feel the panel kind of going a different direction. I'm like, ah, no, beep, hit the stop button there. We're not going there. Because here's what people are forgetting. Moses said, who, who, what's your name? He said, my name is I Am. And, and he said, I don't want to do this. They're not going to believe me. And God backed something up. And this is what we have to look forward to in the earth. He said, I am will be with you. In other words, my presence is going to go with you. What, if you got I am, everything you need wrapped up in his name, then what are we getting so worried about? Oh, there's an eclipse coming. We're going to talk about that possibly in a minute. What's his name? I am. I am the God that can stop the sun rays from knocking out the communications and the goofball red China and the loony loonies of the liberal left and the ridiculous rhinoceroses of the right. God God is bigger than all of that. Get your eyes off it. Oh, but now the house is about to be even. Listen, God already said he's going to make it a house of cards. He's a party party crasher and a potty crasher probably too, right? He's going to crash the whole thing. Let God be God. He's the I am. That's what I say. All right. So now look, so then men marveled after Jesus calmed the wind and the seas. And they said, what 
manner of man that even the winds and the sea obey him. So they were constantly questioning, who is this God? Now let's go to Matthew 16. Look at verse 15. Pay attention. Well, how, what's God's name? All right, notice the question Jesus asked. He said unto them, whom say you that I am? He's introducing his name, and they're all like, duh, I don't know. I mean, and God is staring at them right in their face. Wow. Not one of them said, you're God, except Peter, by revelation, had to get it from the Father. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. He's trying to explain. Who do men say, I am? I am. My name. Who do men say I am? What's my name? Who am I that stands before you? Uh, thou art the Christ. You are the son of God. <laughs> it's about time somebody figured it out. And I like who they compared Jesus to when he says, who do men say I am or my name is? Who am I? Who's standing in front of you? Who am I? Am I just your teacher? Am I just Rabboni? Am I just a prophet? Who am I? I'm God. And he used that word, I am. And you would think that would have been the clue, but they go, oh, uh, and watch this. For those of you that don't think Jesus was uh, politically involved uh, or confrontive, the first two people that they guessed said, well, men say on the streets, you're Elijah, is what some are saying. Well, Elijah was no joke. He was, no, uh, he was a nonconformist. He, was, he, was, he mocked them, man. And they said, Jesus, you're just like that crazy Elijah. And then some say you're John the Baptist. Oh, really? The guy that really repent the kingdom of heaven's at hand dressed in, you know, uh, like Robin Bullock or something, you know? <laughs> so, all right, Robin, that's for you. All right, now watch. Now let's go on. Now look, I'm more of a dignified prophetic voice. He is too, but in a different way. He's called to have the John the Baptist look. I'm called to have the, I don't know, what is it? I get on a, oh, Rocky, I get on a plane and they always tell me, you look like a game show host. So I have a prophetic game show host. <laughs> okay. I'm like, of all the things you could compare me to, don't say game show host. All right, look, look, okay, look at John 8, 25. Let's go quickly. Stop it. You guys have been with me for 27 years since the first Sunday, and I don't appreciate you calling me. Uh, they said, man, he looks like Bob Barker up there. You know? oh, they didn't say that. All right, look at John 8, 25. Then they said unto him, who are you? And Jesus said unto them, even the same that I said unto you from the beginning. And then look at what he does. He answers in verse 28. So he said, I'm telling you, I've already told you who I am. Then he said unto them, when you lift up the Son of Man, in other words, when you crucify then you shall know that what? I am. I am. You will know that I am the Son of God. You will know that I am the same one that identified myself and named myself to my servant Moses. I am he. Are you getting this? Yeah. Jesus kept trying to reveal himself. Man, I've had Jehovah dipsticks come to my, <laughs> um, my uh, and Mormons and different ones come you know, through the years. And they try to tell me, well, he never said he was the son of God. And I pull out these scriptures and show them I am. And they just sit there and go. Okay, let's go. Let's look at John 10. All right, look at, uh, oh, look at verse 53. Uh, look at Jesus' response. I like verse 53. Jesus' response. Are you greater than our father, Abraham, that they said, which is dead? And the prophets are dead. Whom, who do you make yourself out to be? And look at his answer in verse 58. <laughs> Jesus said, oh, yeah, I was around before Abraham, yeah. And I say unto you before Abraham, I am. I'm God. I was there before. And if you just heard what I said, I used the name of God. That's who I am, staring at you in the face in human form. And they got mad, and they wanted to kill him right then and there. They knew he just compared himself to God. Why do you think they were so mad? He maketh them a claim when they were uh, trying him next Good Friday. They said, he claims to be the son of God. He kept using the word I am. <laughs> and they didn't like it. Look at John 10. Look at verse 24. Now they trap him. So then the Jews come and they said unto him, how long do you make us doubt? If you be this Messiah... Tell us 
plainly. No more parables, no more jokes, no more doing miracles that act like you're God. We want to know. We're putting you on the spot. Yes or no? And look at what Jesus said. I love you, Jesus. Look at Jesus' response, verse 25. Jesus said, I already told you, but you don't even believe me. You don't even believe the works that I do in my Father's name. They bear witness of me. Now, let's go back. Look at John 10. He said, I already told you. He already told him in the chapter. He already told him in the conversation. You got to look. Look at verse 7. Look at verse 7, 10, 11, and 14. Look, Jesus said, uh, verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door. Look at verse, what is it? 10. The thief cometh not but to steal, kill, and destroy. I am. I am. I've come to give you the God kind of life because I can. Because who's staring at you saying this about this abundant life? Just so happens to be God. In human form, the word became flesh. He was telling them. Verse 25, I already told you. I am the door. I am the life. Look at verse 25. Jesus answered, okay, go back to now uh, uh, verse 11, I believe it is. Or uh, yeah, 11. Look at verse 11. I am the good shepherd. He's already telling them. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. This is why I'm here. I'm God. I'm the God of the great I am. And I'm coming as your good shepherd. And I'm giving my life. He was telling them in verse 7, 10, 11. And now look at verse 14. I'm the good shepherd and know my sheep, and I am known of mine. Go back to verse 24. Tell us plainly. He just did. He gave you four verses worth. And now look at Jesus' answer, verse 25. I already told you. I already told you. That's why I kept using I am. All right, go to John chapter 18. Look at verse 5. So now Jesus is, is praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he's talking to his father, and all of a sudden, then they came to arrest him. And they answered him, okay, go to verse 4. I think you've got to see verse 4. If you can back it up. If you can't, then I'll just read this. Okay, Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come, went forth and said unto these that were coming to arrest him, who are you seeking? Look at verse 5. They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said unto him, <laughs> uh, I am that I am. And by the way, that word he is not in the original. The King James put it in there. He, say, he said, Jesus said to them, I am. I am God. That's my name and that's who you came to arrest. And Judas also stood with them. Look at verse 8. As soon as he said unto them, take out the word he, they added that, the King James Version, the original is. As soon as he said, I am, saying his name, they fell backwards. Because he's God. All right, you got it? So now you know why. You know why. I'll just quote these. In Matthew 26, 63, Jesus, they get into another dis discourse. Say, are you the son of God? Come on, tell us. Well, he had been telling them. He had been telling them. I am the door. I am the vine. You are the branches. I am. He kept using I am. I am. Now, in your English Western uh, understanding and comprehension, you just think it's like, hey, I am your pastor. No, it's different. He was saying the name of God. I am. I'm God. The word has become flesh and has dwelt among you. I'm fully God and I'm fully man. I am. And they couldn't see it. And then in Matthew 26, they get down and say, come on, man, are you the son of God? He had been telling them and telling them and telling them. And then I like what he says. He says, after this, you're going to see the son of man sitting at the right hand of power. And that's when they wanted to crucify him big time. All right. So let's go on. I want you to see this. So now you know the biblical thing. Go back to verse 10. Now you know why they said what they said. Who is this? That's what Jesus kept having to do. If they would have known that he was the Messiah, they would have never crucified. The Bible says the Lord of glory. Yet Jesus kept giving clues on who he was. Don't ever let a Mormon, a Jehovah Witness, or a Muslim, or anybody else try to tell you that he was not the Son of God. He completely, clearly identified himself as not only God, the I Am, but as the Son of God. Now, I want you to see this. Why did they say, who is this? I already told you. Because 
The high priest would go and get the lamb. This year, Jesus was the lamb riding in on the donkey. Now, let's talk about these two processions. You've got to understand what was going on at this time. The city was greatly stirred. Look at John chapter uh, 11. You know what happened. Jesus, in John chapter 11, Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. And he, this is creating quite a stir, all right? And now I want you to go to verses 4, uh, let's go to 45 through 48. I think we'll go there. Then many of the Jews which came to Mary had seen the things which Jesus did, believed on him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what things Jesus had done. So now they're just getting stirred up. They gathered the chief priests, the Pharisees, a council, and said to them, What do we, for this man does many, many miracles? Verse 48, if we let him alone, watch this, this is why, you know, with Good Friday coming, why they were so scared. He said he was God. They didn't believe him, and they didn't hear when he kept saying, I am. I will let him alone, and all men on him will believe, and the Romans shall come and take away both our place and our nation. They'll take away our temple. They'll take over our Israel. So guess what? we got to frame an innocent man. Right? Look at John. Uh, Jesus in John 12, he's at Lazarus' house. We'll go on. But I want you to see that there were two processions. And you need to understand this because it's two kingdoms collided. On the one side, and I want you to see this. Now, you have to understand in the Bible that anytime you see the word east in the Bible, most of the time it's a reference to judgment. So when it says that the king is going to come into the eastern sky, and he's going to wage war, right? right? He's going to bring judgment against the heathen. He's going to bring judgment against the wicked when the Lord returns, right? Yeah. Notice it's the eastern sky. When the priests would go in with all the sins of the people, they would enter in through the east door, and they would head west, right? Because what does Psalm 103 say? says, God casts your sins as far as the east, that's judgment, you're guilty of your sins, your iniquities, as far as the west. West is mercy. When God parted the Red Sea, when he brought the locusts, it was the east wind. When he restored everything, closed the sea, got rid of the locusts, it was a west wind. Because it was judgment on Pharaoh through the east wind, locusts. Right? The, the opening of the Red Sea and drowning them. And then the mercy of God to deliver Israel. So now what you have to understand is what's taking place. And this is really important. So Jesus is coming from the east gate of the city. He's coming, as he said, from the eastern sky. He's coming in riding on a donkey, acting as who he is, the high priest. He is the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. The high priest was mad. The priests were angry. That's why they said, who is this? He's coming in. And he, on purpose, is challenging because you have to understand what was happening at that time. The Roman government had implemented uh, socialism. They were in control of everything. In fact, Caesar called himself the son of God. And he was so prideful. And he came down on the Jews and made the Jews subject to governmental taxation and control. It was socialism. And Jesus, by coming in, when Pilate was coming from the West, he was acting like he was the Roman government of mercy. But really, what he was coming is towards the East to impose the judgment of Rome upon the Jews. How many say it? And the two kingdoms were colliding. It was a big, big stirring. And they said that the sound of Pilate's uh, the hooves of all the horses and the sound of the spears that were going like this. It was so loud that it was competing against the Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And Jesus chose at that exact moment of Pilate's entry of the government to challenge the government politically, to challenge it socially, to challenge it culturally. Because it was thought in the culture, you just comply to whatever the Roman government tells you, like what people do today. 
rather than we the people in the United States of America and have a constitution that's to have the government be about we the people. It's the government trying to tell we the people what to do. Well, that's what the Roman government did. And Jesus at that moment, two kingdoms collide. There's only two kingdoms, the kingdoms of God and the kingdom of darkness. And they were colliding. And Jesus was not concerned or afraid to interject politically, culturally, socially, religiously. Are you here? Now, not only were there two processions, but there were also two donkeys. Remember, let's go to Matthew chapter 21. I'm going to bring this to a close. In Matthew 21, look at verse 2. So in Matthew 21, notice what Jesus said. He said, say unto them, go into the village opposite you, and immediately you'll find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Notice what he said, loose them and bring both of them to me. Now, this is important that you understand that there was two. It's, it's extremely important. Now, you have to understand that the mother donkey was in front. And the mother donkey, the name for that donkey, the type of donkey that it was, represents something that you have to understand why Jesus wanted to use these. The name for a female donkey is a thon in the Greek, A-T-H-O-W-N, and it means to be hard, to be mighty, to be stern, to be strong. It's, it's what you would talk about being mature, a mature leader, but you are strong. You are, you are a leader, okay? So he brought that. Jesus brought that in. But then the young donkey, notice it was a donkey that was never to be ridden before. How many remember that? You get this donkey that no man has ever ridden upon. In fact, you can find that in the book of Luke. Now, what is significant about that? Because the young donkey, where it says it has never been ridden before, is the definition of that donkey that Jesus rode in on. Now, how many of you would dare to get on a young male donkey that has never been ridden before? It would kick you off. It would kick and scream and be stubborn and throw you off, right? So on the one side, Jesus with the mother donkey represents the authority, the strength of his kingdom. But now he's riding on a young donkey that had never been ridden before. And that young donkey, the definition of that young donkey, when you look at that word young donkey that had never been ridden, it's the word chamor. And it literally means, are you ready? Foul. Trouble. The color red. Mark that down. He's riding on the back of the donkey that had never been ridden before. And part of the definition is trouble and what? Red. What did Jesus come to do? Shed his red blood. It also means stubbornness and rebellion. Jesus rode in on a donkey that had never been ridden before. That means red, trouble, foul, stubborn, rebellious. Look at Job 11 verse 12. Why? Look what the scripture says about man and how we are born into the earth. For vain man would be wise, though man, our nature, our stubborn, rebellious nature. And by the way, the first man's name was Adam. Do you know what his name means? Red. What does the male donkey mean? Red. Blood man, red man, and though man is born like a wild donkey. The reason Jesus came in on a donkey is because it represents human flesh that is stubborn. That there are people so stubborn that heard the gospel, they, they, they've lived their life around those who told them about God, they went to church, but they're going to be so stubborn, so rebellious, they will love trouble and they'll go to hell. Kicking and screaming as they go to hell. Because that's what human flesh is. It's like that donkey. And why Jesus was on that donkey who is trouble and foul is because that's what all of our lives are. We are in trouble if we don't surrender to Jesus to sit on our stubborn fleshly nature. Every one of us in the sound of my voice, at some point, you need to surrender your donkey, fleshly, wild, rebellious, troubled nature to the Lordship of Jesus. That's why it says in Luke 6, 46, why do you call me Lord? But man, you don't do what I say because we have a donkey nature. Now, it was also in Deuteronomy 22, 10, it was written, you, when you plow your field, when you go on in your life, you are not to plow with an ox and a donkey together because an ox represents we as servants of Christ. And we're not to do the things in our life. Remember? What's the first uh, thing that Jesus said? Seek first the kingdom of God. That's the ox nature. 
and his righteousness and all things will be added. It's when you and I, we try to seek the kingdom of God in the ox nature of the servant of God. And we try to mix it with our human flesh, the donkey rebellion that we can't ever plow together. You won't be a successful church and you won't be a successful Christian if you do. Now I want you to look at Genesis 22 verse 3. Now let's look at the Old Testament. Let's look at the NIV version. It says, early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey and took with him how many servants? Okay, how many disciples did Jesus go and commission? Two disciples. How many servants are with Abraham? Two. And his son Isaac, his only son. All right, fast forward to Palm Sunday. Jesus sends two disciples to go get a donkey. And who was put on that donkey? God's only son. All right. Now keep reading. And when he cut enough wood, what was Jesus crucified on? Wood. And he set out for the place that God told him about. So you could already see in the story of Abraham and Isaac, the story of Palm Sunday, and how God was already setting it up to show that we were stubborn, rebellious like donkeys, human flesh that needed a Savior. Now, lastly, I want to show you something. Now, in Exodus 13, I want to show you something. Show a picture of the donkey for a moment. I want you to look at the back of the donkey, the type of donkey that Jesus rode on, so that you understand Palm Sunday. Okay, what do you see on the back of that donkey? That's a cross. So that type of donkey, okay, Chamor, is this type of donkey. They're rebellious, they're stubborn, but they just happen to have a cross on their back. Show another one. Okay, here's another one. Now, what's the name of that kind of donkey? Remember, red. Notice the cross. What was shed on the cross? Red blood of Yeshua. And people are agnostic. People are atheists. You're, you're, you're an idiot. <laughs> At least that's what my opinion is. And by the way, it's my opinion. That's why the Bible says a fool says in their heart, there's no God. I mean, when God can do this. Now, why? Look at Exodus 13, verse 13. You've got to end with something. You always have to understand that whether it be Noah, when God built the ark, what was the ark for? Yeah, there was corruption and there was evil, but God had a redemptive plan. If you will listen to the redemptive plan rather than get caught up in evil and corruption, you would be saved. Moses, hey, I have a redemptive plan, and it's through a deliverer that you keep criticizing, indicting, and the no-never uh, 45ers out there. That's, that's exactly Israel. He, Moses was my God. Make Israel great again. Right? And they didn't recognize him. They wanted to turn him back and turn him over to the authorities. We have a deliverer, Maga. And what do they try to do? Oh, let's... Christians, let's just turn him over like we did Samson when God raised up a deliverer, tie him up with ropes and hand him to the Philistines. And God's trying to say, do you not see that I'm trying to deliver your nation? But I don't like him because he's mean tweeted. He's whatever. Or I always voted Democrat. Well, you better not now. What is there on the Democratic Party that you would even want to vote for? And you know what's so sad? There's very few Republicans you can vote for anymore. But at least I know what their party stands for. The Republican Party versus the party that wants to continually, man, thank God for John Amachukahuka or whatever his name is, that keeps going to these school board meetings and throwing that nasty, perverted stuff out. I mean, how many of you saw his latest one? He went in there and read out of the book on what a father was doing to his child. And the child was describing, and he read, and I mean, I got like one minute into what he was reading, and I had to fast forward a thing to where he got, you know, kicked out. And I'm sitting here going, how can these people that call themselves school board members sit there and listen to this stuff, let him continually read it without saying, that's enough, man, we're going to throw this absolute perverse trash out of our libraries. So anyway, God always has a redemptive plan. What's a redemptive plan? A plan of help and a plan of hope. Right? No matter what. Now, there came a point in Israel that they had to give the firstborn of all their flock. So what do you do if you have a lamb born and you have a donkey? Donkeys were their, their burden bearers. Donkeys were what they used around their, their homestead. It was their car. Come on. 
And, 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 and donkeys were considered unclean, so they couldn't be sacrificed. They were one of the only animals that were considered unclean that you could not sacrifice. So what do you do? Look at what verse 13 says. And every first of a donkey shall you redeem by a lamb because the thing is unclean. If you want to keep your donkey just like mankind, it's got to take for your substitute a lamb to shed his blood for you to keep your donkey. If you don't shed a lamb's blood, your donkey won't be redeemed. You're going to have to break its neck. And so they would have to do that. Now, notice the only two things that were redeemed by blood, mankind and a donkey. This is your Palm Sunday. God is trying to show us that he is the lamb that rode on that donkey as our high priest who shed his blood for our polluted red blood, Ezekiel 16, on the cross, which is on the nature of all of us and the donkey, and guess what? He redeemed us. When they were doing this with their donkeys, taking a lamb and shedding, a blood for, shedding the lamb's blood for a donkey, it was pointing to you and I and our stubborn nature. Now stand to your feet. I want you to look at uh, Luke chapter 21 as I close. I'm going to always remind you that God has a redemptive plan. Look at what God says. There's going to be signs in the sun, just like that donkey. And there's going to be signs in the moon and the stars. Are we about to see that tomorrow and April 8th? And people are in fear again. Did we ever learn from Y2K? Did we ever learn from all the people that didn't realize that they became religious moonies in the blood moon craze? And uh, what happened? All the people that got you hyped up became not got you to be moonies, but they became monies. And they made a lot of money yeah. off of fear mongering. Yeah. Okay. And God says, and there'll be distress of nations with perplexity. Keep reading verse 26, Pastor Doug. Oh, and men's hearts will fill them for fear because they're going to look at the things that are coming on the earth. They're going to look at the moon. They're going to look at the sun and they're going to be absolutely in fear. And the powers of heaven will be shaken. So God says there's going to be some natural things. But then you'll see the Son of Man coming in the cloud with power and glory. I believe God's going to do something that has to do with glory. And then he said, look up. For your redemption draws nigh. In other words, when you look at the sun, when you look at the moon, when you look at eclipse, don't look at it without understanding. As long as God's spirit is in the earth, he always has a redemptive plan of help and hope. Now, let's go to Acts chapter 2. I want to show you this because the Lord dealt with me in Tulsa about this. Look at Acts 2. And I'll show wonders in heaven above. So how many know there's going to be wonders in heaven? There's going to be the sun that turns dark and the moon to blood red. And signs in the earth beneath. Now watch this. There may be when these signs come, you may see something trigger by way of tornadoes. I mean, oh, God prophesied on New Year's Eve, it's going to be a very tornadic year. They've had, Pastor Gene said they've had like 16,000 tornadoes since that prophecy in December. In America alone. Now, fact check it. I hope that's true. I know it's in the thousands. And people are like, well, see, but those tornadoes went along the path of the, of the uh, uh, eclipse. God already told us the enemy would use tornado, tornadoes, just like he did in Mark 5 when Jesus was going to go deliver a region with a man that was possessed with a legion of demons. And, he, and the devil sent the storm. And God already said, the devil's going to bring tornadoes. And what do people do? They get on the fear-mongering wagon. Oh, these tornadoes, oh my God, see, it is going to happen. If God can cause the sun to stand still, do you think he can absolutely make solar flares hit Pelosi's home and, and uh, you know, uh, others? I'm just teasing. I'm teasing, Pelosi. I'm teasing. Right? God can control it. Where's our hope? My hope is in God's redemption, not the beast, not the Antichrist, not China, not the left or the right. My trust is in God. In fact, Psalm 121, the, 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 the prophet, you know what he said? The psalmist? He said, uh, I'm looking to the hills and they're surrounded and we're in big trouble. Where does my help come from? And then boom, a light goes off and he said, oh, my help comes from the Lord. And then he goes, oh, the God that doesn't sleep is the God that keeps Israel will keep me. Oh, and the Lord will watch this, you sun, moon people, and you moon, night people, or whatever. He says in Psalm 121, once he got a clue, oh, the Lord will keep the sun from striking me during the day. Hello, eclipse. And the moon by night. Hello, 
moon eclipse. You ain't going to touch us because of the God of preservation. Where is our faith? Where is our prayers in the God of redemption? No, we jump on the bandwagon and get on and pontificate. And can I tell you the biggest problem is I don't, I don't reject what eschatology teachers say or prophecy teachers. The problem that they have is they go towards fear and they don't, a lot of them, I'm not saying what they say doesn't come to pass, but a lot of them hasn't. And they never get called out as false. And you keep buying more and more of their stuff. And here's the problem. Many of them don't operate in the office of a prophet. They don't even have the kind of authority delegated by Jesus to even address such an issue at that level. Acts 2, can I, I'm just, I just want to be a Christian or a dentist. Okay, look at verse 19. I got to get done. Pastor Doug, come. Come on, come on, let's go. Here we go. And I'll show wonders in the heaven. Now, there's going to be some things that happen in the earth. Blood, oh, that sounds ugly and nasty. Fire, ooh, man. Oh, man, those solar flares and vapors of smoke. Oh, my God, the results of something on fire. Yeah, there may be natural things that happen, but we're to pray that they don't. Now, look at those words, blood, fire, vapor of smoke. Those are not just natural manifestations. They're redemptive words. The blood of Yeshua that protects, preserves, guards. Fire, the fire of the Holy Spirit in his presence. And how about this? Vapor of smoke. How did God appear to a nation? 